Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is the 12 o'clock session. Uh, here to, you're in for a treat. Andreas is a, a lot of fun to listen to. Um, he's going to be talking about um, audio transport and routing, and especially NMOS ISO 8, the new API for controlling um, audio mapping within uh, video packages. So, uh, ready to go, and hand it over to Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Um, so, good afternoon. It's, uh, yeah, afternoon starts right now. Um, thanks for stopping by. I know everybody's hungry, um, so I try to keep good food for you uh, and keep you um, fed right now. So, my name is Andreas Hildebrand. I'm working for ALC Networks. Uh, I've been a long time uh, development engineer. Uh, now I've been promoted to, you know, spreading the word about uh, anything uh, media over IP, including, of course, all the good stuff which is done here on the IP Showcase 702110, and of course for our own uh, technology of Ravenna, which is fully AS67 and 2110 compliant. So that's a bit of background about me. Let's jump into 2110. Again, for those of you who just dropped in and have no clue what it is, just a very, very brief recap. 2110 is for professional media over managed IP networks, so for production environment. We transport and well, synchronize elementary essence streams. So that means that we are transporting video, audio, and ancillary data, the typical content of an SDI signal, as individual essence streams. And as I said, it's primarily targeting at live production applications. Synchronization has been taken care of by precision time protocol with a specific SMPT profile here. Now, um, have a quick illustration on how 2110 works before we jump into the audio topic. We have a typical SDI signal, which we want to transport onto a 2110 environment. So we have a 2110 sender, which takes the SDI signal in and basically produces individual essence streams. So we are not transporting the multiplexed uh, signal anymore. Um, as a combined signal, we have individual video ancillary audio data streams which are available on a network. So a receiver can subscribe to these individual streams and can rebuild the original SDI signal, hopefully. Um, well, that wouldn't be of much benefit at all because we could do that with SMPT 22-6 for a long time. So, but um, the benefit comes into game if we look at a typical production environment. We have audio devices which are not keen of getting the video at all, right? They just are interested in the audio. Since all of this is now multicast on the network, the audio devices can just subscribe to those audio channels they are interested in processing. So they don't have to receive the full bandwidth uh, video signals anymore. And also on the sender side, we can now have cameras not taking care of audio at all, just producing video ancillary data. And of course, lots of audio sources which just produce the audio signal. They don't have to build an SDI signal with a you know, dummy video in it. That's the whole picture of 2110. And synchronization among these individual essence streams is taken care of. PTP, precision time protocol. That's a diff totally different presentation, nor what I'm talking about uh, today. Uh, if you look at the program, we have lots of interesting stuff about how the synchronization works. Actually, if I remind myself correctly, have I recognized that? I have one of those presentations in the afternoon today. So have a look at the schedule, and we'll talk about synchronization later in the afternoon. A quick, uh, very, very quick look into the document structure of 2110. It's not just one big standard. Well, at the end, it compiles down into a big standard, but it's nicely separated into functional logical blocks. We have uh, definition, system definitions and timing in the dash 10 document. We have uh, payload format uh, definition in the dash 20 document. We have traffic shaping for this high traffic, for this high bandwidth traffic video. Um, uh, on the network, so uh, we have sender requirements for sending out this high bandwidth video data so they don't overload the network or any subsequent uh, reception stages. Um, Dash 30 is about how to transport PCM digital audio. That's what I will uh, focus on for, um, for a few minutes. And we have the Dash 31, which is AES3 bit transparent transport. You know, PCM digital audio is just linear 24. AES3 includes an additional byte for transport of the AES3 metadata bits and for everything non-PCM, like Dolby E and these other kind of things. So that's the Dash 31 document, which, by the way, uh, is a payload format which has been directly taken from the uh, Ravenna AMA24 uh, specification. Finally, Dash 40 for the ancillary data, and we are going to look at the audio stuff. 
The dash 10 document is important because it has all the basic fundamental definitions plus the system timing definition. We have the dash 30 for the digital audio, PCM digital audio, which basically relates back to AS67 and the dash 31 document for AS3 metadata. That is all we need to know for the audio side of things within 2110. Now let's look at the uh, most often um, used format, the digital linear audio. SEMD did a smart move. They defined that digital audio, linear 24 bit digital audio, shall be transported just as it has been defined in AES 67. So instead of inventing their own new transport format, they were looking at what's available outside, and they found that the AES 67 is just good enough to be taken as the basis for transporting digital audio. So, hands up, who does know, nothing know about AES 67? Oh, to bring that down, who knows about AES 67? I should see a lot of hands. Okay, for those of you who don't know, here's a quick recap. AES 67, AES uh, Community Standards, has been published in 2015. And it's important to know it's an interoperability standard. So AES 67 never has the intention to be a complete solution on its own. Its intention was to build interoperability to enable interoperability among different already existing solutions. And that is a very well-maintained standard as well, uh, as we had a third edition in 2018. So it's, um, by the middle of 2018, we published a third edition. Um, we didn't define anything new, basically, which would break backward compatibility. We were just removing some uh, ambiguities, uh, adding some clarifications. And the only thing we actually added at the end is a PIX thinking about lunch. No, wrong thought. Uh, we are not talking about uh, any meaty thing, although it's a fairly large addendum we did. It's a protocol implementation conformance statement where each manufacturer can actually take off all the requirements which are outlined in the standard to state what of the requirements and optional um, things being defined in the standard is available with that particular product. That's it. So again, AS67 uh, is there to actually enable interoperability between all these different technical solutions which can transport audio over IP in real time. They're all based on IP, that's the commonality, but previously to AS67 they weren't able to actually talk to each other, which is a pity. They're all based on IP. We couldn't transport um, data from Ravenna to Dante without going through digital or analog audio. So when AS67 is there to actually solve the problem, um, just like uh, Leifer and Ravenna, who made it uh, able to talk to each other in 2012, when AS67 was published in 2015, all these different technologies adopted the specifications in AS67, and through that we are now able to actually interoperate IP-based audio streams based on the definitions set forth in AS67 between all these different solutions. So now Dante can speak AS67, Ravenna, LIFO, QLearn, and whatever is else there. An interoperability center. We won't get rid of all these different technologies because AS67 is just a very constrained small subset just defining what is required to make the interoperability happen. It does not cope with all the additional functionality and flexibility the individual solutions offer. But as an important message, yes, we can now interoperate between all these different solutions. Well, in order to actually make that happen, we need technology in place, or at least technology definitions. I won't go through any of these in detail, just to give you an idea what needs to be defined in principle. We have synchronization, media clocking, transport, quality of service, encoding, session description, connection management. All that needs to be defined and in place in order to make a, something like AES67 happening. And again, it's interoperability specifications. We had a very narrow specification on each of these blocks uh, is what you can see here, PTP, 48 kilohertz, RTP for transport. We use uh, differentiated services, L16 and L24 PCM with one to eight channels at 48 samples per packet. That's an important combination which you will see um, uh, coming up uh, in the next slides. And we have SDP and IGMP for the connection management. What is not being defined in AES 67 is anything which relates to discovery. So just by having AES 67 on the network, we actually don't know what is available. 
but that was on purpose because there are so many different uh, discovery and uh, registration schemes out there that we felt if we would mandate for one particular um, service within AS67, we would limit the acceptance of the standard and the applicability to certain uh, use cases. So that has been deliberately left out. People ask me, oh, the standard is broken. I can't use, although I have the streams, I can't use it. I can't connect to the dentistry because I don't know what's available. Do we consider these devices being broken? They just work the same way. Every one of you has a device like this in their pockets. But just because sitting in the same room, being able to talk to each other with your phone, I can't see your numbers. I don't know your numbers. You have to give me the magic number. Then I can dial the number in and everything else is taken care of. It's exactly like AS67 is being designed. Get the magic numbers over, and then every, uh, everything else is taken care of by AES67. That's the idea. So back to 2110. Now we could say, well, everything we need to transport um, for uh, uh, linear digital audio is being defined in AES67. Wonderful. What else can we say? Well, we have some constraints. So SEMTI was not fully agreeing with everything which had been written in AS67, they were looking through some of the definitions and said, oh, we don't need this particular thing and this particular thing and this particular thing, but we want to have this and this and this for audio distribution. Now, the particular um, uh, explanation on what the commonalities and constraints are in detail is again a separate presentation, and you can find uh, a white paper which should have been available right now, Terry, I guess. The white paper is available on the AIMS webpage in the resource, resource section, which uh, describes in, in, in deep detail what are the commonality and constraints between 2110-30 and-10 and AS67. So the question at the end is, can AS67 devices play nicely in a 2110 environment and vice versa? Um, with a uh, few constraints being fulfilled, the answer is yes, it will work. And it's not too difficult to actually make it happen. I want to add um, something which goes more into the direction uh, of how do we do channel assignment. So what is that? SEMTI 2110 has added conformance levels to their definitions with respect to how many channels are allowed in a particular stream. Now we have that level A, that sets forth everything which has been defined by AS67 as a mandatory requirement. So we can say every level A requirement is already part of AS67. So any AS67 device is fully compliant with the level A constraints. Now Senti was worried about this eight, uh, about the um, one millisecond packet time. They thought, okay, for some applications we need shorter latency, shorter packet time latencies. So they defined a level B, which um, remains with the one to eight channels, but requires support of 125 microsecond packet time. Now what's packet time? Packet time actually is the amount of audio time residing in one single packet. So with one millisecond at 48 kilohertz, it's exactly, do your math, 48 samples, right? So each packet in level A has 48 samples, one to eight channels, L6, uh, L24 uh, PCM data in it. Now with level B, we only have six samples per packet. So we have a higher packet rate, but small amount of audio in that, or time of audio in there, so we have a smaller originating latency. So we can dial down the latency by decreasing the packet time. That is level B. So any device capable of doing level B needs to support 125 microsecond packet time, a higher packet rate plus, of course, level A as well. And then people were worried about the A-channel limitations. Well, now the A-channel limitations basically is the most common use cases, you know, up to surround sound um, source, which needs to be distributed. Plus, with one millisecond, we can't squeeze more than eight channels into one packet without exceeding the maximum allowed packet size. You know, packet size, packets are transported in the network with standard network mechanisms and with IP running usually on Ethernet, we have a constraint originating from the Ethernet frame size. 1,500 bytes of maximum Ethernet payload. So at the end, if you do your math, we have one millisecond, 48 samples, L24, with up to eight channels, which can, can be squeezed into one packet. But if we dial down the packet time, so the number of samples in the packet, 
we can easily enhance the number of channels that packet can carry, right? So we have a conformance level C, which says, OK, we keep the 125 microseconds, six samples per packet or six frames per packet, but with up to 64 channels, which now enables us to transport MADI signals in one flow, instead of having to use eight parallel flows with a standard AES67 definition. So these are the conformance levels, uh, which have been defined in uh, 2110. Level A, the only mandatory level, is being supported by AS67. Oh, and then people came up and said, our video production are also running on 96 kilohertz at certain times. So it's time to define the X levels, which uh, basically resemble the same ABC levels, but with 96 kilohertz requirement. These are all optional levels. So the only mandatory conformance level is the level A, which is supported by AS67 which is good for AS67 because in that respect it's fully compliant with 2110. So now, if we have that uh, definition for the transport, what do we need for a working system? Well, we have that transport stream, but how do we get it across? I mean, it's the network taking care of it, right? But how do I know where to route the packets? How do I know what channel I want to, or what stream I want to uh, connect to? So we need connection management, which is not covered by 2110 because it's all about transport and synchronization. Neither it's covered by AES67, so we need connection management, right? Luckily enough, we have another industry alliance taking care of upper layer functionality, which are not part of the standard, and that's the Advanced Media Workflow Association defining the Network Media Open Specification, or shortly known as NMOS. Our NMOS is setting forth are a number of uh, specifications which are intended to complement the existing transport standards like 2110 or AS67 with respect to upper layer functionality. So let's have a closer look into the NMOS specifications. What do we have uh, as of today? Uh, we have discovery and uh, registration. So that means we are now able, through that specification, um, to know what devices are on the network, what resources are on the network, what streams are available on the network. We have an ISO 5 specification which talks about connection management. Now, once we have streams available on the network, which are registered in a registry system, we could now tell a receiver to actually subscribe to an existing stream. That is ISO 5, stream connection management. Then we have ISO 6, that's about network control. Remember, we had the Dash 21 document which talks about traffic shaping. Likewise, we need to manage a network with these high traffic rates of video transport to actually tell the network through SDN means where to actually route and how to actually route these high bandwidth streams. So ISO 6 gives, ISO 6 gives us network control so we can see how is the network being utilized and where do we want to route the streams and do I have capacity and so on. That's ISO 6. We have ISO 7, event and tally specifications, all about uh, communicating current states and state changes uh, from uh, end device to a control system and also vice versa. Um, and then, most important for what we are talking here, we have the audio channel mapping. Remember, if I subscribe to a stream which has eight to you know, 64 channels in it, how do I know where to patch the incoming channels to? I have a number of IOs, which of the channels shall I take and where to patch them to, to the device. And that's about ISO 8, it's talking about this audio channel mapping in end devices. We have further specifications like uh, uh, best current practices documents, uh, grouping of NMOS resources, and there's a bunch of more stuff in the works which actually all complements the existing standards and the existing um, specifications. That's very active work. Uh, supported by all of these um, new industry leaders, like I see John there, I imagine Grass Valley, Labo, uh, Navy, you only heard Reiner before, they are all supporting this work. They are actively contributing to this work and feeding in their practical experience into these specifications. So it's a very good um, uh, support on these uh, specifications. So let's have a quick look on what's important for connection management. We have the ISO 5 stuff. It's designated to make it simple for applications to actually connect or disconnect streams or flows. That works like uh, uh, illustrated right here. We have a sending node, we have a receiving node, we have an application logic, a broadcast control system whatsoever. 
Now that broadcast control system needs to know what is available in terms of resources on the network. That goes through ISO 4 registry, so devices register into the registry, application logic can query the registry and actually knows what is available. Now then it can tell through ISO 5 a sender and a receiver to actually create a connection. And then the connection is flowing across the network. And the good thing is that all these IS whatever specifications are independent of the actual stream format. So they are not limited to just supporting AES67 or 2110 or uncompressed active video or linear audio. They basically are independent or agnostic to any of the format uh, which is actually running on the system. So it's a very flexible uh, principle. So that's ISO 5. The challenge then is, how do I know, for example, in a surround application case, if I have a six surround channels which I need to feed from the processor into the individual speakers. Okay, how do I do this with a 2110 or AS67 setup? Well, physically, everything is well clear. Every device has its individual connection to the network, right? Sender and the um, six speakers over here. So, and um, the option, the first option I have, of course, is the processor can distribute the individual essences as individual mono streams, right? So there would be unicast streams, and of course, since they are unicast streams, they would run to the individual devices. A solution at hand, right? We wouldn't need any, anything more than that. We just need to nicely address the destination of the streams toward the particular uh, speakers. Now, from the network perspective, that is not a very efficient use of network resources. We are setting up six streams, which means you know, six times the overhead of RTP packetization and managing six different streams and so on. But it's certainly a way to go. Now, another option is I'm setting up a multicast stream with those six different channels inside. So standard AES67 streams, one to eight channels, so I'm just choosing six channels. Set it up, send it onto the network. Now, what happens is now, all these devices subscribe to that single stream. So all the devices receive not just one channel, they receive a stream with six channels in it. Right? So, and then of course the challenge is, if I'm looking at a particular speaker, the big subwoofer over here, I have, I'm receiving a stream with six channels. So how do I know which channel I should subscribe to or should I patch to my output stage, to my amplifier stage? And that is exactly where ISO 8 kicks in. So ISO, uh, ISO 8 is about channel mapping. So it maps flow channels, which are in the stream, to individual device I.O. channels. So how does that work? What is a, uh, ISO 8 defining? Let's say we have a device, it's a general view on a device, that has some physical sources, inputs, and some physical sinks, outputs. These can be, I mean, digital or analog uh, um, uh, inputs, outputs. That can, this can also be stream inputs or outputs. Now, ISO 8 is now defining generic input and output blocks. You know, because uh, the, the management system can't not know about the individual uh, um, specification characteristics of all the devices which are out there and connecting through um, AS67. So we are defining generic input and output blocks. Hello. Which um, basically. Um, have a characteristic of how many channels they can cope with. Uh, so this is a very simple example of a two-channel input block and a two-channel output block. That's why we have two sources, two sinks here. And now, within ISO 8, we have a patching mechanism. Once we have these generic definitions, they are isolated from the real physical stuff here. And now we can add a patching map, which basically says, OK, I want to connect channel 1 of the input side, of the input side here, with channel one on the output side. And from there, the device takes us on outside of uh, ISO 8. So these are the parts which are known to the registry system. So the broadcast controller knows these logical input and output blocks. It knows the cap capability of this patching map. And this is a very simple example with this, you know, two, two in, two out uh, patching map. And it can make these patches. So the API is specification a function to actually make these patches immediately or on a timed basis. Um, 
Of course, ISO 8 uh, is a standalone specification, but it works best in interaction with ISO 5. Uh, as we have just learned, we are subscribing a channel to a general purpose reception block or receiver, and from there we take it on into ISO 8, into the input block, the uh, patching map output blocks, and further on. So this is an uh, 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 easy example. Let's say we have a sending device with a two-channel stream. We have a receiving device, which has a uh, receive block where a stream or a flow can be patched. This is all done by ISO 5. So we don't have any audio channel assignment yet. We're just uh, having a two-channel stream, a two-channel receiving block, and through ISO 5, we tell the receiving device to subscribe to that particular two-channel stream. So, and that's then, that's further on, that's where ISO 8 actually kicks in. We have the generic input block with a two-channel assignment. We have two outputs in this particular case. It could be any other number of outputs, of course. And then we have this patching map, and now we can tell the speaker, let's say the speaker has uh, the channel one output, we can tell the speaker, okay, out of that stereo stream, you please patch that left channel, input channel, arts down into the output channel. That's the way ISO 5 and ISO 8 interact with each other, or, well, yeah, combine with each other. Um, just a brief look how definitions uh, look like. You see that's nice uh, JSON uh, code here. We have the input channels, uh, receiver block, that's an AS67 uh, um, audio input, the output blocks. Don't go into details, that's programming stuff. Just to give you an idea how this looks like in real code, you can find all the specifications. They are published uh, on the uh, NMOS GitHub. I will show the address at the end. Now, what, must, what has to happen to actually make this uh, patch? We have a client, that's the controller, the broadcast controller, right? Well, we have the NMOS uh, or uh, ISO 5 specification, and we have the sender connection management API, ISO 5 API, and the receiver connection management API. So what happens is the controller uh, gets the uh, SDP information, which is the stream description, from the sender, gets it back, the SDP information, and then tells the receiver to actually make the reception of that stream. So it patches the STP information into the receiving block, and the receiver then establishes the connection through usually IGMP means. <coughs> so that's ISO 5. That is subscribing to the stream. Now, the stream uh, needs to be, uh, the audio channel stream needs to be patched. That's where ISO 8 kicks in with the receiver channel mapping API. So first thing we do is we get the information about the input blocks, output blocks, and the patching map from the device into the controller, and then the controller knows the capabilities of the patching map and the input and output blocks, and can now, through the, uh, um, through the patching call, actually instruct the receiver how to actually map the input channels to the output channels. This is all done with ISO 8. So this is the nice flow, how you would actually make a connection from the perspective of the uh, control application. And this is all generic stuff, regardless of what devices you actually have. If they support NMOS ISO 5 and ISO 8, that's the way to go. Uh, here's a final uh, view onto a typical device. It's an IP SDI gateway. Uh, you're sending out uh, from the SDI signal the video source as an individual asset stream across the network. You're sending out up to 16 channels across the network. Some of those channels might be used to further do some um, non-PCM audio encoding, decoding, and so your object data, whatever, uh, which then fits nicely into a surround channel mapping. And as you can see, on the output side, the left and the right channel from that first stream are mapped together with the process streams of the lower two channels of the uh, uh, SDI audio signal, and they are used to patch the surround channels. That's our view on the uh, typical SDI. IP gateway, and uh, if you want to know more about the, all the Enmo stuff, you will nicely find it on GitHub. Uh, just go to Amber TV. There you find all the definitions, all the information, and all the detailed specifications about this. It's all open, it's all published, no licensing fees, no black boxes. Everybody can implement and support this. And if you want to learn more um, from us guys, um, we are at uh, North Hall at N2503. We have Ravenna AS67 and 2110 demo system going on, and I'm happy to explain anything in further detail on a running system. Thanks for your time.
Thank you, Andreas. We made it. We have a question for our time for a question or two. Okay. Question. I'm sure I've just missed it, but how? What's a recommended method of doing audio shuffling outside of uh, outside of a given device? So I, I want to send a bunch of diff, uh, uh, individual audio channels from various flows or streams into some other device. They're different streams. Is there? Are people going to have to implement that? How does that? IS, ISO 8 actually covers also different streams. The, the simple example was just with one stream and assigning st uh, channels from one stream to the mapping and to the output channels, but you actually can receive whatever number of streams your device is capable of receiving. And then that was the example that we had before in this, uh, uh, in here. Actually, we were taking different, from different streams, different streams, we were taking data and patching this uh, together. So that's audio shuffling. Okay, uh, Andreas, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for staying here. Thank you.